All right, students, welcome back to lab number five. And in lab number five, obviously, we just want to build off of lab number three and lab number four. This time, as in lab number three and lab number four, we basically took the stock prices and used EY ratio for three different periods in time and built a stock investment strategy, right? Based on either buying one stock or 10 stocks based on the EY score in three different periods. Now, let's take it up a notch and let's actually calculate EY because remember, EY is interesting ratio in the sense that it uses price to calculate it, which means that the EY value changes from day to day or, or, or trade from moment to moment, right? Because of that one price component that's constantly changing. So now let's calculate EY for all the prices for a given set of uh, for a given set of dates, and let's start visualizing or what we say do exploratory data analysis or do visual analytics, all this all these buzzwords from data science, which basically means we're going to do some we're going to do a bunch of graphs just to uh, get some sort of insight around the data and the ratios we're looking at and the ratios we're looking at. All right. So just like before, we're going to get our data that we need. Now, I will show you guys how to build your daily price. I, talk, I talked about how we're going to use QuantMod to build your daily prices for different stocks. Um, so just to give you an idea, at Rutgers, when I connect directly the cable directly into my laptop, I don't even use the Wi-Fi, but I connect the daily into, uh, directly into my laptop. It takes me roughly about 40 to 45 minutes to get all get about all 4,000 something, 4,222 stocks worth of historical prices uh, going back from, I take it from the beginning of 2007, right? I mean, we don't even need to go, we shouldn't even go even back that, we should actually, we shouldn't go back that far, but we can go back further. And the reason I did 2007 is because I was like, uh, you know, you'll see that the table gets massive. And uh, for some of you, it's going to really push your memory in your computer. If that's going to be a situation, um, what I recommend uh, several times during the video is to always take a subset of the daily price file. Don't take it from 2007. First of all, you can't right now, as you're going through looking through the video, you can't run this code yet because it's going to take you, depending on how fast your internet, possibly a few hours, let alone 40 minutes. So I loaded up the daily price, the RDS table for you, right? It's there for you guys to use and you guys can always go back and mess around with downloading this data, all right? We're going to recalculate the EY ratio with the new daily prices, right? So we're going to have tons of EY. So we're going to have a different EY for every day at this point. And we're also going to look into uh, we're going to also look into calculating a new ratio called ROC. Finally, return on capital. Um, the daily price has basically just adjust the close prices. So let's load it in and see what it is. Now, first things first. All right, let me set up my environment right here. If you remember the code, we're borrowing from the code from Lab Four, where we wanted to take the most recent prices. We were able to take the most recent prices for our tickers because we wanted to calculate certain returns. Well, here now, we're altering that uh, for loop a little bit in the sense that uh, we want to basically calculate all the tickers, all the tickers. Now, here I jumped the gun a little bit here. I have this vector tickers that I don't declare. So let's start from there. All right, so let's start from there. So let me load in my first my file, my fundamental file. Actually, first things first. Create a new R script. And we will save this as Lab 5. Now we'll call this I am Lab 5. Make it slightly bigger. So we can see what Lab 5. This is. There's times I want to minimize this because it's going to get kind of crazy. And then let's go ahead and import or call in my data file. So I'm going to open my fundamental file. And at this point, you guys have this saved. If you weren't saving that file from before, you're definitely saving it now. 
data, data.rds open. That's fine. Excellent. All right. Okay. Sweet. Now from here, um, I jump, like I said, I jumped the gun a little bit because here's the code that I basically want to use to uh, download all the daily prices and this is how I use it, right? So first off, notice I have a data.table here that I'm declaring and it's empty. There's no columns in it, right? So first things first, let's go in and load up, call the library for our data table. All right, now this line right here, I'm gonna go a little out of order, but this part right here, now I'm not gonna run the whole code obviously because it's gonna take 40 minutes. What happens here is, oh, I can't do that here. Daily price equals data.table. What am I doing here, right? Why am I creating an empty table? Like literally if you click on this right here, right, you get a no data available. It's nothing there. There's no columns, nothing's declared, but why am I doing this? I'm doing this because as I, remember tickers is gonna be a, a vector of tickers in my data set. I'll show you guys in a moment how I get that, right? I obviously is gonna be each iteration of the ticker as we go through step by step. What happens here is when I, let's say hypothetically Apple is the first ticker, hypothetically in my vector of tickers. So I will become Apple, we come down here, we're gonna run get symbols like before with the auto sign F for this range of data. Notice I'm doing it from 2007 to 2020 of April 3rd of when I ran this. Um, you guys can you guys can mess around with this. Feel free to say or to run your own set of daily files and, and crank it up so that I mean shorten the date range so that one, it doesn't take you as long, and two, you have the more recent data, right? Have the more recent data instead of April 3rd. And so you would just change the dates. Now here, we get a quant mod, a, a XTS table, right? When we do get symbols. And it's gonna be an ST because I did auto assign F. From here, what am I doing? If you remember from your XTS, labs and exams, I'm doing ST at all the rows of ST of the Apple data, but the sixth column, what's the sixth column? The adjusted closed column. So basically, I'm taking all and I'm taking all the adjusted close prices and I'm putting that in a vector called price. Now here in line seven, I'm doing something completely new you've never seen before. All right. In line seven, let's see, I have it right here. Jumped the gun a little bit, but that's fine. Um, in line seven, right, I have this function called index. What does index do? Okay, index is a function that basically gets, as you can, it pretty much says what it does, gets the index values from the tables. What are the index values of an XTS table? What are the index values of an XTS table? Again, let's just do a quick call library quant mod. They can see this live. So let me grab uh, Apple. All right, there's Apple. And as you know, just to verify, if I simply do Apple again, all the rows, comma six, right, we just get one set of data, which just you just to close the uh, um, the adjusted closing prices, right? But now what is index on Apple gonna do? If I do index on Apple, it gets the index values. And what are the index values of the XTS table? They are the dates, they are the dates. Remember, indexes are basically unique identifiers, some sort of unique identifier for each row, right? For each row. So, and again, for, in some tables, by the way, you can have indexes, the same index value for multiple rows. So that's something else. But anyway, here for a time series or an XTS table, date is gonna be unique for each row, right? Because that's why it's called a time series. That index function extracts those dates for me. And that's what I'm doing here. And that's what I'm doing here. All right? 
So date is now going to be a vector of the date, uh, the dates that I have the prices for. And now, here in line eight, I'm creating another data table on the fly, That's different from my daily price. I call this temp underscore table. And it's literally going to be three columns. It's going to be the dates. It's going to be the prices for those dates. And then I add a third column called ticker. And that ticker's value is going to be whatever is in I. So in this example, let's say it's Apple. And because it's just one single value, data table takes that single value and just brings it all the way down into every row, every row, right? And now here in line nine, this is the tick, this is the kicker right here. In line nine, you guys remember the R bind function from before. In our in line nine, what does R bind do? It stacks one table on top of another. I'm calling R bind on a table that is empty, has no columns, it pretty much doesn't exist, save for the name, save for the name. And I'm saying concatenate to this table temp underscore TBL. So what happens on the first loop? Well, what happens is an empty table gets concatenated uh, with a, right below it, an existing table. And then this, that table gets now set to being that new table stacked on top of one another. So what does daily price become at this point? Daily price now will become whatever is in temp underscore table. All right. It has the same, it will have those columns and those value types. And then what happens subsequently in the other tickers, the next ticker of I, the next ticker of I, the next ticker of I in the for loop, is going to keep binding temp table to whatever daily price is and keep over overriding daily price. So what keeps happening is every other every temp table that we derive or calculate for each ticker, we keep appending to the previous ones in daily price. So daily price becomes our big table that pretty much we keep concatenating each iteration of temp table to to get at the end of when the for loop finally ends one massive one massive table of dates, prices, and tickers. All right, just so you could visualize it just a tad bit. All right, so basically what I said, I said okay, price is going to be. You notice I did as dot vector because this is a XTS table, right? With data tables, we don't have to do that. We can be, uh, implicitly become vectors, right? If we just choose one column, but here we have to explicitly make it happen, right? Here, this is going to be index. All right, and now uh, this is ticker is going to be whatever was an I. So let's we have made the assumption as Apple, or right, let's just do it on the fly, just like I did in the code. And now my, what's it called, a temp table. What does it become? So instead of I, I'm going to actually put the ticker we're doing. I run this, open it up, and this is the table you see. Just for that iteration of that loop, this is what it's going to be. And this gets up, this gets appended to that empty file that does not exist, daily price, and daily price will become this table. And as we loop through, as we loop through, daily price, the temp table is going to keep changing to the, each individual to, to whatever ticker we we're downloading from I. And that daily and that temp table is going to keep appending. To daily price. So at the end of it, we're going to have all the daily prices for all the tickers that were in the vector tickers, that were in the vector tickers. All right. And obviously, we have our try, catch, and error function, which is getting a little bit more advanced. And that's so that, look, there's going to be tickers there that don't exist anymore, right? For whatever reason. And rather than have our for loop throw an error, and you'll see a lot of errors being thrown or warnings being thrown, uh, it, it turns into a warning pretty much. It's just going to keep chugging on through. That's fine. If a ticker doesn't have a price, we don't want to dwell on it. We just want to move on to the tickers that we do have prices for. Okay. Now let's go back here to the tickers itself. How do I get how do I get a vector of tickers with all our? Well, let me ask you guys. How how would you go about using the data file 
and grabbing a, from there extrapolating a vector of tickers for to use in the for loop, right? Well, relatively easy. Okay, I have a data right there. Um, I haven't processed data yet uh, into the DF table using our fancy code and all this stuff. So let's just use data for now. Remember data in the original data table, prime gives you the vector. So if I do data dollar prime right there, you see all right. That's my tickers, right? But it's gonna repeat. Remember, we, we, wanna, we don't wanna run the same ticker over and over again. It's gonna cause all, already too many problems. We just wanna simply want from that come all the unique tickers. So how do I do that? Well, there's a function called unique. Right there. And it literally gives you, in this case, right? Here, let's, let's actually load it up into tickers right now. Tickers equals. And as you can see, tickers from here, it gives you 4,222 tickers, right? Right there. And that's how many. And that's the how many unique tickers we have in our data set, 4,222. So we're, we're pretty much ready to rock at this point. So that's how you get that vector, vector tickers. And from here, you plug in the code, right? You plug in the code and you can, you can uh, you know, kick it off and it'll run for you, right? Just like we did before, except that we have a little more going on here from lab four. All right, let me, for the sake of, uh, Let me take the code and let me at least write it down here. Now again, please don't run this code, right? Or if you're going to run it, severely reduce the date ranges, right? If you want to do just sort of like uh, to mess around with a proof of, proof of concept of some sort, right? But I will have it here so that you guys can't mess around with this. Some of you guys are probably at, um, some of your internet connections are, are, are really fast. So you guys can go ahead and mess around with this. But for everybody else, just go through the uh, video and then go back and mess around and have some fun with this. All right. But this is for anybody in finance, it's a cool way to show something cool to your professors, how you can get the daily prices, even though those guys probably just use Bloomberg. All right. This is the date range. And obviously, you can take the more recent date range. We actually didn't even have to give it to, if we just ignored the two, it would just give us the most recent date from wherever the from we're choosing from. All right. Let's fix this line right here. All right, let me scooch this over to see how it looks. All right, and I like, I like the way it looks. Let me just move my error over. Okay, and here we are, right? And here we are, guys. So this is, we would run this, right? Oh, oh, I have my empty table right there, excellent. So we would run this, and at the end of this, we would have a data table, right? We would have a data table, not a data table, we have, we have a, a, a file called daily price, and through the magic of editing, I just, I'm just gonna go ahead and you guys can do this too because if you look on Blackboard, I have that file there for you. I'm just gonna go ahead and I'll load it up in my system. Now, um, go ahead and download that file if you haven't downloaded it already. You might, this is gonna probably take you a little bit of time. It's a large file. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and open uh, my file. That already happened before. That's fine. And as you can see, as I'm reading it in, that took a little time, right? Usually it's not automatic. And what do you see here? I'm not gonna even click on this box right here because I'm, I'm terrified. It's not gonna, it's gonna take a while to open. But what do you see then in terms of number of observations, guys? 9,800,437 rows. This is a large table, all right? This is a large table. And for some of my students that your machines can't handle it, um, I say, you know, give it a go. If it crashes, if your system crashes, or if your memory just stalls, 
right? First of all, make sure you have as much uh, memory, as much of this environment cleared out, right? So I'm actually I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, get rid of the stuff I don't need. And just to show you how I do that. So you could do that all in one shot if you click on this, but I don't want to get rid of my other files. So I've shown you guys some of this, this trick before. If you do RM, that gets rid of my data containers right there. And I'm going to do RM on the temp table. And that gets rid of that. So now I just have these two data frames, all right? You guys do little tricks like that. Now look, also if you think your data, uh, daily price data is still going to be, it's too big for your memory or it, let's say your, your computer already crashed and you're back on the video or whatever, um, just reduce the amount of daily prices you have, right? Just remove the uh, daily prices you have. Remember, daily price, if I simply just, it's already a data table, right? Look at how many rows, tons of rows. Um, the date starts from 2007. If you want to mess with, if you want to reduce the, if you want to take a subset of daily price, how would you do it? You just filter it by date, right? If you want to get less rows, just simply say, all right, you know what? For the sake of this lab, I will, and this is again for people that are struggling with the, the table being too big. You guys can go ahead and filter the data from, let's say, date is less than, remember, this is the date column is actually a date object, so you can actually use the date, that you have to, you can actually use the less than and greater than to filter for it. So if I do simply, I'm not gonna run this code because I don't wanna reduce my file, but let's say you take it from instead 2007, you take from, uh, let's say it's 2020, so let's say you just take 10 years of data, so you take it from, either 2010 or even that might be too much. Maybe you want the last seven years. So maybe 2013. So you would say something like 2013 01-01, right? You figure it out how much data you guys need to get, make this work. And if I were to run this, I'm just gonna run this section right here. Cause I don't wanna, again, I don't wanna reduce the amount of data I have, right? Uh, oh, sorry. Nah, I'm, I did the wrong way. I was wondering what am I doing wrong. Not less than equal. I want to do greater than. So basically, I want all the dates from this point in time greater than then. So again, let me rerun this. Apologize for that. And as you can see from here, if you were to run the full code line of code, your daily price would be a subset of what we originally downloaded, which is just from 2013. So that's just a, and as you, as you can see, our, your rows of data went from 9 million to looks like 6 million. So for those of you that uh, have memory issues, this is one way you can go along with the lab with less amount of data, all right? For me, I'm gonna go ahead and just use what we have and go from there, okay? So we have daily price, all right? Let's party now. All right, now we want to, what we want to do is we want to be able to match up daily price, right? Daily price, look at the dates, with what? With our data file, all right? With our data file. Now, if you remember, our data file, let me go ahead and get the to head data. Right, head data, we have the date column. Now, if you look at the date column right there, if you recall again, the data file is quarterly data, and the date column comes in a YYY MM format, and it's not even a date object. It is a, right there, it is a integer. All right, it's an integer. All right, so we're gonna do the same trick. This is the same trick from before we did in lab three and we use for lab four as well, but it's gonna be just slightly more involved because now we don't have just three periods, three months and three different periods. No, 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 we have daily prices. So we're gonna have to be a little more specific and a little more creative in how we do this, all right? So how 
are we going to map those daily prices? Go back here. How are we going to map these daily prices to quarterly data? I mean to quarterly quarterly dates. Well, we know or you guys know that each date has is in a unique quarter, right? So for example, let's look at these dates right here, 2701, 03, 01, 04, 01, 05. What dates are these quarter, which, which quarter are these dates in? They're in the first quarter, right? Remember, the first quarter is from January to the end of March. The second quarter is from April to the end of June. The third quarter is from July to the end of September. And the fourth quarter is from October, uh, October, to the end of uh, December, right? To October to the end of December, the four quarters, right? So here now, I want to show you a new function called year and quarter that's going to assist us in in finding the quarter ending or the quarter of each of our daily dates, right? And then once we have the quarter for those daily dates we can now link up the data file that has our fundamental data with our, daily with our daily price file, which is what we're trying to do here. All right, so here, let's do this uh, simple example just to show you guys what I'm talking about. Let me copy it. All right, all right. So let me change. Guys, I'm just going to press Enter over here. Notice how it gets tabbed in. I'm just doing this just so you guys can see things easier, a little bit easier. Fix my quotes. All right, that's going to seem to look like this. All right, so here we go. I have a DT vector, which is in, which is a, a vector of dates, just like last time. I have a price column and I create this sample table called SAMP DT. All right, here we go. We have a very simple table right here. Four dates and prices. All right, from here, right from here, I want to show you guys how we can use these cool functions called year and quarter, right? That again, that are provided from the data table package, which is really cool. And we can extrapolate out the year, right, and the quarter from each date, right? We don't have to think about it, what it is. They've, because um, the date column is already a date object, the year function and quarter function will figure it out for us. So I go ahead and create these new columns using these two very, very convenient functions. And I'm going to basically create two new columns called year and quarter. And now, as you can see, I have a, a, year, a year column and a quarter column. Now here, obviously, the first, the, the four rows, they're all going to have the same year, 2018. But here you can see that the quarters are different. For the first two rows, the quarter is going to be one because they're both in the first quarter. And right here, in the last two rows, it's two because they're both in the second quarter. Again, the function figures it out for us. If we simply do an str command on samp bt, right? You can see that when it the year and quarter when it ran those functions, it gets those values back as integers. It gets those values back as integers, right? Now, it's important we need both the year and quarter because um, it helps us differentiate the dates. And not only by year, but the quarter as well, which is what's necessary for, for it to map up with our fundamental data. Okay, 
Now here is where we get a slightly more advanced. What we do now is we're going to use the buy feature and we're going to we're going to do a buy, we're going to do a grouping by both those two new columns we created, by the year and the quarter. And we want to identify what is the largest date in each set of year and quarter. All right, in each set of year and quarter. Okay, so why are we doing this? Because remember, we want to figure out what is our, um, I mean, technically, we don't need to do this for our fundamental data, right? But hypothetically, if we wanted to extrapolate out the quarter ending prices from daily prices, we're not going to do that, but, but hypothetically, if you wanted to, right, how would we identify what is the quarter end price in our daily price? How would we do that? Well, we would do that by simply doing um, this grouping, this nifty little grouping right here. And you guys now are pros at the group buys. So you know what's happening here. All right. Actually, let me make this table just a little bit. My concern is you can't see this as much. Let me just a little bit bigger. All right. You guys know what's happening here now. So once you have the buy there, you're having subtables created by the year and the quarter. Right. Once you have the buy there, you have subtables being created by the year and quarter. So for each unique year and quarter pairing, there's going to be a unique subtable. Well, it just so happens we have two unique combinations of year and quarters here, 2018 and 1 and 2018 and 2. That means there's going to be two subtables. From those two subtables that are created, so this first set is going to be one subtable, the second two rows is going to be the second subtable. All right. So what's going to happen here is <clears throat> once these two subtables are created, then it's going to go ahead and run this part. It's going to create the max function on date. So it's going to, for each subtable, it's going to say, listen, give me the maximum date you got, daily price you got for each subtable. So for the first subtable, it would be this one right here. For the second subtable, it would be right there. And that date is going to be in a new column called QDT. All right. Right. And there it is, QDT. And as you can see, for each row now, it has that date. Okay. It has that date. Now, what is that column and that date signifying? That is signifying that for each one of these prices, right, we now know what is the last, for each one of these prices, they, these dates, they're in a certain quarter. And this date right here is the last date that there's a transaction for the quarter that these dates are in. Okay, so that's why for 2018-01, it's going to be 2018-03 because this date is in the first quarter of 2018 and the last trading date of the first quarter of 2018 was this date and this is why these two dates are the same because this is the last one same thing with down here right so what is the significance of doing that it is because once you have that identified once you have that new column QDT we can now say okay we can now extrapolate we can now extrapolate the last quarter ending prices and that's what happens here recruiter this is what happened exactly right here i create a whole new column called quarter samp date but i won't go ahead and create the new table i'll just go run this command right here that does it and when you do this you just get those two last uh you get just those two prices and those prices are the last transaction of each quarter see that it's the last transaction of each quarter and that's basically how we would basically link up those daily prices, right, to the quarter ending fundamental data, right? That's how basically, I, I mean, more, more specifically, that's how we would get from the daily price, we would get the last transaction or the last closing price for each quarter to be used alongside with the daily table to calculate EY. Now, we could do that. We're not going to do that, all right? But we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to reverse. We're going to reverse it, all right? We're going to reverse it. We're going to uh, take our fundamental data from the data table, and we're going to bring it to our daily price. 
And we're going to do this because, like I said before, unlike other ratio, earnings yield is slightly uh, a different beast in the sense that one of its components is price, which means that we can technically calculate it for every day. All right, and that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Okay, so first things first. Well, let's get the proper order for our daily price, but it should be in proper order, but we always want to confirm it, All right? Boom, all right. Let's now, using the same trick as before, using the ticker, uh, using the, I'm sorry, the quarter and the, the year function, let's go ahead and identify what is the um, max date, right, for each quarter. Now, we can, uh, technically, what we could have done is, we could also just take the, year and date and just change the format and get the uh, the answer we want instead of doing it this way. But I just do this just so you guys have, uh, just so you guys have, uh, have this understanding of how you can get different points in time from a table. So let me just press enter here, just so you can see it. All right, so here now, look at the buy, all right. I, again, there's easier ways to do this, right? I'm just doing this just so you guys can see how you can do group buy. How you can see a new concept here. Where we're group buying not by an existing column. We're group buying now by these functions. See, as in before, I created those columns up here, the year and quarter column. And then I did a group buy by those new columns I created. Here, I'm skipping a step, and I'm directly doing the group buy, in this case, by ticker because I have obviously 4,222 tickers in here. And I'm doing it by the quarter of the date and the year of the date. And notice now I skipped a step. I didn't create two different columns for quarter and year. I'm literally applying the functions directly in the group by. And yes, you can do this because the group by will basically calculate those functions and then go ahead and run the group by, all right? So here I'm just showing you how you can skip that step. And again, I'm gonna do max date and create a new column called date quarter. I execute this, notice the time it takes, right? Notice the time, even with my machine, the time it takes, right? If I run daily price now right here, we see now I have a new column called date quarter, and this is literally the last transaction date on file for each quarter, right? So for the first quarter price is here, 2007-0330, Go down here for 2020 030 and it's showing you the last transaction dates we have. Notice the here, uh, we go strictly from 2020 all of a sudden to 0403. Why? Because now here 0401, we're in a different quarter. And as of the time we ran this file, this was the last transaction date we have for that quarter. So that's why we have that. All right. So that's basically how it works. All right. So we have that we have that date quarter now, excellent, right? We filtered and we can see this. And here I run it for all daily price, but if you wanna, it's easier when you have a massive table to filter for a certain ticker to see things. So if I do daily price ticker equal equals Apple, it's slightly easier to see these different ranges. By the way, check it out, Apple, January 2007, January 3rd, 10 bucks. All right, hey man, you never know. All right, so from here, right, notice that our date quarter, right, it's in what kind of format? It's basically in the format of a date, right? 2007.03.030. But Again, we need to remember that our fundamental data is in that, like I said to you before, it's in that format of an integer, why, four, four year digit, two digit month as an as a integer right here. For example, 2007.03, right? So we need to get date quarter from this date object to this like integer object if we wanted to, all right? So from here, and this, by the way, this, this command right here is gonna probably take a little more time because we're using the format function. Right, the format function, you guys will see it when I run it. 
So I'm going to go ahead and use the same concept as I did from before. Right? I'm going to use the format function. All right? Let me copy this. All right, I'm going to use a format function. I'm going to do this twice. So first things first, you'll notice a little different from our lab four and lab three. I'm now just not using the format for just year. I'm not doing ampersand year. Remember, this is the funky syntax for for when you're changing the formats for dates. This basically says give me of the format, right? I'm adding the ampersand m to it. That will be the two digit month right after the year. So we'll get y, 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 m, m. All right. Now, if I were to run this, I'm going to run this twice for you guys. Let me get rid of this as a dot integer so you can see what's happening. So when I run this, notice how long it takes to run, by the way. All right, so I will now have Apple. Look at that. I have that new column called quarter period, and now it looks just like it looks in the fundamental data. If I run the STR, notice I said looks. All right, if I run STR, you'll see that this quarter period is in character, right? We could probably match that up, but the other table is the other um, quarter ending dates are an integer in the other table. So for this reason, that's why over here I have this as.integer function. I have the format fun function wrapped in that as.integer function. What that does is it's going to go ahead and take, obviously get that format we want, y, 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 m, m, and to convert that into an integer. Convert that into an integer, right? So here I do as dot integer. Right? Run this. Now let me run this again. Again, it looks exactly the same, right? Looks exactly the same. But this time, if I do str daily price, you'll notice these values are they're integers, not characters. So now, not in, not just in visually, but in formats, but also in data types wise, it's the same column as as the one in data. All right, so we are ready to rock at this point, okay? All right, again, this syntax right here is for the YYYMMM, and there's a whole table in R. Uh, there's like, there's a whole chart you can get for R and very fancy ways how you can uh, display the dates that you want, right? I should actually include that for you guys, a little table or something, a little cheat sheet for you guys. Okay, so now we're here. All right, now we're here and we're ready to bring our fundamental data over. But we want to do, because we're going to do some analysis here now. We're going to do some analysis here now. We want to basically see how good EY is at uh, predicting future returns. We know it's going to be not good from our lab four or not that good because, you know, that's not the purpose of EY. But we're introducing another ratio today. So we just want to have these future returns already there for us to analyze, all right? So we want to calculate future returns for each point in time. All right, what does that mean? Well, again, the whole objective of these calculating these financial ratios is so that we can basically, on average, quantify how effective they are at predicting positive stock movements, right? Or even negative stock movements if you want to short stocks for different pricing periods. Now, as we bring, uh, here I have a typo, as we bring the price value, as we bring the fundamental this is a typo. Fundamental values over for the purpose of calculating EY. Um, we want to 
calculate. Now, we could do this later, but we're going to go ahead and do it now. We want to go ahead and calculate our future price movements, right? So, look, you're quantitative researchers. Uh, which price movement, like, what's, what, what time range of a price movement should we be looking at? That's the whole business of a quantitative researcher, right? So they're always trying to see, link up certain models to different, they're always trying to uh, see not only the efficacy of, of different quantitative models, but they're trying to see the range that they're optimal for, those quantitative models, right? And it's a dance, right? It's a dance between the quantitative ratios and the time horizon you're applying those quantitative ratios and models to. For our purposes, I'm just gonna do some generic ranges that uh, researchers tend to look at, right? Three-day return, two to three, it's basically like a two, two to three-day return, but I'll take three-day return, I'll take a five-day return, I'll take a 20-day return, and I'll look at the 60-day return, all right? We're obviously, to do this, we're gonna use the shift function, just like before, right? But with the new parameter now called lead, all right? And this is different. And we're gonna set that, um, I'm sorry, the new parameter is actually called uh, type, sorry, type. And the value we're gonna use is gonna be that the new parameter that uh, it's gonna be set to is called lead. It's called the value lead, all right? Now the default for shift, if you remember, it looks backward, right? That's the default for shift. It goes to the, you choose a column and goes back to the previous rows. Lead, obviously, what does that do right here? It goes forward. It goes forward, right? Now, for each point in time in the daily price, I want to now know, right? Because remember, for each uh, point in time, we're going to have our EY calculated. And now what we want to do is we want to say, okay, at this point in time, the EY was this value. Now, what was the, what was the price three days from now? What was the price five days from now? What was the price 20 days from now and 60 days from now? So because of that logic, we need to shift forward to get those future prices. Now, we need to shift forward to get those future prices. And this is why we're altering our shift functions just a tad bit. So instead of going backwards, we are now going forward. Let me go ahead and copy this. Uh, where can I press enter? Let's do this. I'll do it right here. No, I don't want to do that here. I want you guys to see that. You know what? I'll do it. Let me scrooge this over so you can see a little bit better. I'll do it here. All right. All right. So this part should be no, not new to you guys. I'm creating four new columns called P3 for price three, four, three periods ahead, P5 for five periods ahead, P20 for five, 20 periods ahead, and P60 for 60 days ahead. I have my shift, I'm shifting from price column. Now here, N, Notice how before we've always used to use the column number. We did one colon three, one colon four for n. Now here I'm explicitly I'm using the C function. I'm explicitly choosing how for like it's not going to be a continuous value now. It's basically the same concept. Before I, was, I had a vector that was just continuous. Here now I have a vector that's going to be four different disjoint numbers. The concept is the same. We're just using the C function as opposed to the colon. That's the only difference here. Right, so now it's gonna be three, five, 20, 90. It's gonna shift for three rows, five rows, 20 rows, 90 rows. Here I do type equals lead, right? And we're gonna use the group by, by equals ticker. Why are we going to do that? We are going to do that because when you are at the end date, let's say April 3rd of a particular ticker like Apple, you don't want it going down the rows into the other ticker ahead of it and grabbing its prices, that would be wrong. That is incoherent, right? That's not, that's not the prices for Apple. That's the prices for a totally different ticker. You want to NA in that situation. You don't want to grab the other ticker's price. So that's why we do it by ticker. So this shift happens 
in a vacuum for each individual ticker. So it'll happen separately for Apple, for Tesla, for Facebook, for Google, etc., etc. I go ahead and I run this. Boom. I go ahead, look at my Apple data. And from here, notice we have that P3, P5, and down here P20, P60. We'll look at that in a second. But P3, P5. All right, here we go. So P3 is three days forwards. Boom, boom, boom. Right here. Three days forward, forward downward is the P3 file. Uh, the P5145, it kind of disappears. You can't see that right here. If we forced it, I could show it to you. Well, you know what? Um, I would, you guys can open, a, here, I'm going to open it up. No, I can't open up daily price. It's going to cause a lot of problems. But you guys can actually take a subset of the data and open it up and you can see it. The point here is, down here, notice we have these NAs now. Over here at this point. And why do we have these NAs? It's because P3 for March 30th is going to be 1, 2, 3, 244. And after that, there's no other data. So it's going to come back as NA, right? And you see all these NAs? That happened because there's no more stock data going forward for Apple, right? And that is a direct result of the fact that we did a group buy. That is a direct result of the fact that we did a group buy, and we want that. That's the right thing, guys. That's the right thing. All right, from here, all right, we have our shift function. And now, all right, now we have this nifty little table. Date, price, ticker, date, quarter, quarter, period. We don't really need date, quarter anymore. We'll deal with that in a second. We have our price 520 to P60. We're going to go ahead, we, we, we will go ahead and we'll calculate the uh, returns for that, right? We'll do that. But now, but before we, before we jump into that, we have the prices. So before we go, jump at, go ahead and uh, calculate the returns, let's now go ahead and take our code from lab three and lab four and move over most of it. And, uh, right, we'll move over most of it because we're not going to fully process EY because we need the prices from daily price to do that. So what we're going to do is we'll calculate OI average and we'll calculate total debt and that's all we can do at this point. And then we're going to take those values, uh, the values OI average, <clears throat> shares outstanding cash, total debt, preferred shares, minority interest, and move it from, from, the, daily, from the BF table to the daily price table, okay? Um, again, hopefully this doesn't mess up your, uh, your memory. But if it does, go ahead and take a subset of the data and then do this again, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. Actually, I don't need to copy that. I'll go ahead and copy this. And now let us have our fun from before. You guys can make it easier on yourself. You can literally just go ahead and grab the code from lab three and lab four. All right, it's there nice and neat. I'll just go ahead and do this real quick. Boom. All right, DF is done. Let me change the names because this thing is so unwieldy.
All right, let me go ahead and change the data of the order. So make sure it's in the right order. And now let's go ahead and do our little shift action. Take the average, DF, total debt, excellent. And now we are ready to move it over. All right, now you guys know how we move these things over. And it doesn't matter that the data table, the DF table, sorry, is smaller than daily price. It'll move it over in chunks. So I'm going to go, there's, so uh, basically what's happening here is we can do this line by line, or we could do this all in one set, right? Here, I'm gonna go ahead and copy how to do it in one line, right? Now we're doing multiple, multiple moves. All right, you guys know the syntax of moving. It's kind of hard to see here, but do enter here. Okay, good. So you guys know the syntax of moving items one by one. I showed you that already, right? We're moving, look, we're moving the, let's take the first one, shares outstanding. From DF table to daily price. I'm creating a new column called shares outstanding, and I'm joining D daily price in DF by the quarter period column in daily price, the date column in DF, the ticker column in daily price, and the ticker column in DF, right? Again, doesn't matter that the column names are different. All that matters is that the, the, um, the data and the values are of the same format and same data type when they link up, okay? And I will do the same thing for OI average, cash, total debt, preferred shares, and minority interest. I can go ahead and I can do this line by line, six different lines, or I can do it in one shot, right? And how I do it in one shot, here's the syntax, all right? The join is still obviously going to be the same, right? This first part, um, I want to create new columns in daily price from the DF table, yeah. The third part, yeah, I want to link up the two tables by the quarter period column and this column, the date column and, and that table the ticker in that table, and the ticker in this table, all right? Again, same thing, same thing. It's this part, obviously, that's going to be a little different, right? So here, I'm, I'm basically selecting which columns on the right side over here, which columns, using the dot parentheses command, I'm selecting which column, subset of columns I want from the DF table, all right? So I want these ones. And here, after our colon equals, just like in our shift syntax, right, just like our shift syntax, when we create more than one column, as you can see that up here in line 47, we created multiple columns using the, we created we uh, created multiple columns using the C function. Same concept right here. Same concept right here, right? So I have to use a C function when I create multiple columns. OI average SO cash TD PS MI. Boom 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 boom. I go ahead. I will execute this line of code. Ooh, I have a slight typo. Oh, be careful when you copy things over. Notice this part right here. There's a space after the date, right? I, there is no such thing as a date space column. It's just a date column, right? Spaces matter just, just as much as capital and lower cases do. All right, so let's give this a go again. And now it's running. And now let's go ahead. I was like taking this line of code with me. Right here, what do you guys see? Now you see obviously the P columns we created. Go down here a little bit, and now you see OI average, SO, cash, GD, PSMI. We brought it over. We got it. Excellent. Let's go from here now and calculate our earnings yield. 
Let's go ahead and calculate our earnings yield. So now that we're going to have it for each day, which is going to be wild. All the rows, which is now what? It is, actually, I'm going to leave that part out. This is OI average divided by our market cap. Which is a market cap going to be? It's going to be shares outstanding times price plus our total debt minus our cash plus preferred shares and minority interest. Now execute this. Look how fast that was, huh? And now I go here. Look what I have. I have earnings yield. All right? I have earnings yield for every day now. You see that? I mean, it changes ever so slightly, but it does change. It changes ever so slightly, but it does change. It is, it is changing every day because, again, right here, the price, the price portion of this. All right, so from here, I'm going to have my daily price. And notice over here now, okay, I have my daily, I have my EUI. I have all these columns right here. I have a massive table, if I'm screwed this over again, about nine, close to 10, I'm 200, about 200,000 rows shy of 10 million rows, all right? We would already have broken Excel in every which possible way if we were doing this. <laughs> I have, let's get rid of the columns I don't need. Let's get rid of the columns I don't need. And that's what I show you guys right here. This is how you basically delete columns from total debt. I'm not, I mean, from a data table. This is how you delete columns from a data table. I don't need date quarter. I have, I'm gonna leave my, um, I'm gonna leave my uh, other, oops. So I'm gonna leave my, uh, what's that other column here? Um, quarter period. I'll leave quarter period for now because we wanna create another we want, we need to, we're going to bring over the fundamental data. We're going to bring another uh, ratio over it, right, in a moment, right? But so I'll leave that for now, but I don't need date quarter, all right? Date quarter was, I just needed date quarter to get quarter period, so I don't need that. So I'm going to get rid of that, all right? Along with getting rid of that, I'm going to get rid of cash, total debt, first shared minority interest, minority interest OI average, and shares outstanding. Why? Because I, I, I already calculated my EUI. I don't need them anymore. It was temporary. So let's go ahead, free up some memory on our machines. And price, and again, in the data table, this is how easy it is to delete a column, right? This is how easy it is to delete a column. Boom, 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 boom. Automatic. And now, if I run my ticket.apple again, you guys will notice that it's just uh, date, price, ticker, quarter period, P3, P5, P20, P60, and EY. All right. All right. From here now, we can have a little bit of fun. All right. Actually, from here, talk about a little more, get a little more serious with our, our analysis. Right. We have to, we want to basically look at our EY. We want to basically do analysis versus returns. Of our um, of our prices with our EY, we want to get, basically get a gist of what's going on with the data, with these ratios, right? Now, look, we have like again 9.8 million rows. The human mind can only handle so much data, right? That's why R. Whenever you type anything in R in the panel, it only gives you a subset of data. It gives you like I think data table gives you like what 10, 12 rows, something along those lines. The purpose behind this is because the human mind can't mind doesn't handle that data. What the human mind does do real well is it can handle visual visualization. It can handle images really well, right? This is the purpose behind visual analytics. You're, right, you're not crunching all these numbers, all this analysis to basically get to say, oh, yeah, I can, you know, I can go through these rows of data. And this is what the analysis this is, what it means, this is what I see. 
visualization helps you get a summary of the of the data you're looking at and it also helps you analyze that data it can help you analyze the distributions of the individual columns and the relationships between different columns right which is essentially uh, the bedrock of visual analytics all right R has many graphics packages like a lot of them are native a lot of you guys have done graphing in R using the plot function and there's third-party packages a lot of tons of third-party packages do a lot of cool graphics in R Right, R actually is very strong in terms of in visualization and graphicing, graphic. But a popular graphic package for visual analytics is called ggplot, right? And when you download ggplot, you're gonna literally put in ggplot2, not ggplot. For some reason, the package name is ggplot2, all right? Now, ggplot is strange, right, when you start working with it. Ggplot, the syntax of it, like I see the, I show you the basic syntax right here. This is the basic syntax. It's strange when you start working with it. In fact, one of my students, he was in an internship and he was graphing with ggplot and the quants or data science, whatever, they're like, why are you using g or whatever, the, the senior analysts were like, why are you using ggplot? It takes so much longer. Just do plot so you can instantly see the analysis, right? And yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Obviously, ggplot's a little more complex. ggplot was never written in such a way for you to graph your results. That was not the point, and that's not the point of ggplot, right? I was explaining to my student and uh, the, his senior, I was like, look, your senior analysts are not doing analysis. They're graphing their analysis. There's a difference, all right? ggplot is written in a way so that its functionality coincides with the language of what we call exploratory data analysis. Visual analytics is basically the subfield within exploratory data analysis. And again, we're jumping into data science. And the language of exploratory data analysis, the methodology of going through data and analyzing it, right, coincides with the, or should I say, ggplot wrote the functionality to coincide with basically the steps one would take in exploratory data analysis or the concepts within exploratory data analysis. That is why the, the syntax of ggplot is kind of funky because it's meant to, it's meant to be seamless with the science or the concepts from exploratory data analysis. That's where the syntax comes from, right? But that's what makes ggplot so cool because you can do very cool analysis fairly easily. Right, once you set up your, your ggplot functionality, uh, you know, the weird functionality correctly, you can do analysis seamlessly and pretty, pretty easy compared to if you use other graphing packages and other, um, um, like even in R or even outside of R, like Excel and stupid Tableau. Tableau does a lot of cool things, but you have to do a lot of point and clicking, where, where the you know, superiority of R is that you, know, you can do a lot of copy and pasting and do things much faster. But anyway, so this is basically the basic uh, functionality skeleton of ggplot, right? You have the error call, you have uh, that, the actual main function. Once you download it, by the way, you have the, the main function. And in the main function, you put your data table. ggplot always works off a data table, all right? And then you have, you'll see these pluses everywhere, these pluses everywhere. They're not math. These pluses in the world of ggplot, literally, if you think of a cake, it means another layer another layer of commands you're doing or another layer of visualization you're doing or another layer of analysis, right? The whole point of ggplot is you're, you're putting a layer upon layer upon layer as you're doing your analysis or functionality upon layer upon layer upon functionality as you're doing your analysis. And this, point, uh, this, this basically means geometric objects, right? And this is a very fancy term to so basically say graphs, the, what type of graphs you want to use. All right. Now here, this is, this is another strange thing about ggplot. There's a function you'll see everywhere called AES. That stands for aesthetics. All right. Um, an easy way to understand what that is, is if you want to think about it, that's basically your axes, or that's basically your, the columns that you are using within the data table that you decided to analyze. That's basically which columns am I looking at right now and what am I doing with that? This aesthetics function is cool and it's versatile in the sense that it can be in the ggplot function, it can be an individual 
uh, graph visualization functions, it's versatile like that. And it's versatility, there's a reason for its versatility, and I'll show you guys that in a moment, right? But uh, let's go ahead and just jump in to the graph, right? Just jump into the graph to see what's going on. Now, let's go ahead and do something real simple. Let's create a line graph of Apple's EY, all right? Let's create a line graph of Apple's EY over time. Just get a visualization of it. So first thing first, I'm going to go ahead and call my ggplot. All right, there it is. Done. Boom. You know, look, at this point, you've installed it, right? If you haven't installed it, just press pause on the video and go ahead and install it. All right, now, let's go do this step by step, okay? I want to graph the EY for Apple. Now, I'm going to warn you, daily price is a massive table. If you try to graph the whole table, ggplot can't, this is one of the downsides of ggplot, ggplot can't, it's going to take a long time to process that, right? Um, this is where using AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, you know, it will come in real handy. So we have to be a little bit smart about this. So the table I'm going to put in is daily price, or is it? But it's going to be daily price filtered just for the um, Apple ticker. All right, filtered just for the Apple ticker. So ggplot is just going to get a subset table, not the whole daily price. It's just going to get this, the, the rows associated with Apple. And I think that's just like 4,000 rows or something like that. So that's, that's, that's nothing. So that's easy for ggplot to handle. All right, so that's how we start off. We start off the first parameter is the table that you want to analyze. Now, what I like to do is I put the aesthetics right in the main table because usually I do a simple graph. So I'll just follow that lead again. So I'm going to do aesthetics. And here now I choose which columns I want and in which potential axes that are going to go. So I know I'm doing the line graph. And I, as you guys know, a line graph has an x-axis and a y-axis. And the x-axis is pretty straightforward what's going to be there. I'm going to put my date in there. All right. And in the y-axis, what I'm going to put there, I'm going to put the e, EY. I'm going to put the EY. All right. I do my plus. Right. And that plus basically means, so look, this first part, what I do is I set up the table, and I set up the columns, and I set up the axes where I want those columns to be. Now I say, okay, I want this, this, um, I want this, the data on the columns now as I instructed the columns to be, to be visualized in this particular graph. That's basically what I'm doing with that plus. And the particular graph I want is the line graph. Now, as I do GEOM, all the different graphs, they start off with GEOM for like geometry or something like that. They're very, very um, mathematical in this, in this regard. But look, you can see all these, um, all these graphs at your fingertips, right, right off the bat. All these base graphs at your, at your fingertip. We're going to go ahead and use the line one, right? And that's basically all I need at this point, right? I click enter. It says the morning message. If 560 rows were missing values, right? 560 rows were missing values. And this could be because we have a lot of EY data that we don't have because um, we don't have fundamental data after 2017. I mean, yes, after 2017. So we have about three years of data we don't have. So here, you guys can see, it's probably clear on your machine, right? Let's put the window, but this is the earnings yield, right? This is the earnings yield. And look, if we want to get a little more fancy, we can go ahead and filter. We have noticed the dates go out over here. This is the null data that's being moved. We can add another filter if we wanted to because we are awesome at data tables and we can say is dot finite scooch that over a little bit is dot finite ey so i'm filtering this table even more the tickers are apples and only the apple rows where we have a finite value of ey i go ahead and click this and you notice the error went away Right, and now it's literally from 2007 over here all the way it scooches over to 2018 over here. 
and we can see the EY. Now here's the brilliance of visual analytics. Right off the bat, what do you guys see? We see an EY for that data, for that range, that date range, that period in time. We see Apple had an EY range from slightly less than 0 0.01 to about 0 0.045. All right? That was the range it had for that period. So right off the bat, I know what? I know, hey, for the last, uh, what is it, 2017 to 2000, 2017, 2017, 2017, for those, so for those 10 years of, uh, years of trading from 2007 to 2017, the EOI range for Apple was between like 0 0.01 and 0 0.045. Boom. Boom. See how fast that was? That's the whole point of visual analytics. Instant insight. And then we see how it tightened. The EY range kind of tightened after 2010. And then after 2012 to 2000, end of, to the beginning of 2018, the range was somewhere between 0, between 0 0.04 and it looks like 0 0.015, right? 0 0.04 and 0 0.015. It kind of tightened a bit. Or 0 0.02. We'll say 0 0.02. And then towards the end, it kind of drifted downward after 2000. I think in the beginning of 2017, it started actually dripping below 0.02. Boom! Look how quick and look how quick and obvious that was. This is the power of visual analytics. This is why people graph, graph, data scientists, quant. We graph, 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 right? Because we get insight into the data, and that insight generates it. It becomes a feedback loop. Feedback loop. That insight now generates what? That insight now generates more questions. That is exploratory data analysis. That is analysis, all right? That is analysis. You want to generate, uh, uh, there's a saying I, I tell my data science students, uh, the graduate data science students, that you rather have approximate answers to the right questions versus precise answers to the wrong questions. Analysis is about asking the right questions, finding the right questions to ask. That is what analysis and any kind of investigation work is all about, right? And what are the questions that are going to be generated here? Well, cool, okay. Why did the uh, UI kind of tighten up? I, I kind of wonder that. And why after, in the beginning of 2017, the UI kind of started dropping down from 0 0.02 after uh, it looked like 0 0.02 became like a floor for the UI, right? So these are questions that come up. And maybe they're important questions or maybe they're not, but they're questions that we can look into and maybe they yield some sort of insight into us about what's going on with Apple. All right, so from here, right from here, we did our first graph, right? And again, the plus right there is like a think of you building a cake. The plus there, you keep layering analysis upon analysis. Let's take this step forward. Um, for this video, I guess this is a great point to, uh, at this point is a good, good time to end this video. And in the part two of this video, we're gonna look at the, we're gonna do some more visualization and we're gonna try to see if there's any, cor cor try to visual visualize any kind of correlation between earnings yield and our price returns. And then we're gonna bring in our other, we're gonna go crank out, we're gonna talk about our second ratio, ROC, and we're gonna bring that into the mix. All right, so at this point, I'll end the first part uh, of the video and we'll just, we're gonna kick it off from right here, the second part.